Cloud plays a pretty good devil, I think. <laughs> but what does that say about me, right? <laughs> Amen. I laugh at those scribes and Pharisees who said, let us guard that tomb. It's laughable, isn't it? Let us seal it up. Let us put some soldiers there. Let us have a watch. And then as Pilate said, you have your watch. Make it as sure as you can. And they did. But you can make that tomb as sure as you want. And Jesus said he's coming out. And he came out. Amen, church? He came out. Let's read some Bible. Matthew 28, please. Matthew 28. Let's read in the Word of God. Our sermon series has been following Jesus. We'll conclude today as we have followed him in his baptism. We watched him there at the river be baptized by John the Baptist. And then we followed him into the wilderness where Jesus was tempted of the devil after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And there again, Jesus was victorious over Satan, the evil one. We listened to his Sermon on the Mount. It was three chapters long, and we listened to Jesus preach that sermon and give us the, um, the, really the delineation of discipleship and the commands and the necessity of taking up our cross and following Jesus. <clears throat> and then we watched him transfigured. We went there to that high mountain where Jesus took three of his trusted men, Peter, James, and John, and while they were sleeping, the Bible says Jesus was changed before them, transfigured. He allowed his divinity, his, his divine nature to be seen there on that mountain. And Elijah and Moses appeared with him there, and they spoke of Jesus' death that which was to come. And so last week we looked at the crucifixion. And every time I look at the crucifixion, I thought, how evil can man be? How evil? Man can do some evil things. Humanity can do some wicked things. But to treat the Son of God that way, to take the Son of God for which Pilate himself said three times, I find no fault in him, nothing. And I've tried. I've tried to find something, and I find no fault in him. But still the hostility of humanity and the blood and the mockery and the evil that was shown there, the crucifixion, as they hung the Son of Man between two thieves to die. And today we're going to follow him to a garden tomb. We may have to wait three days, but good things happen there, right? In chapter number 28 of the book of Matthew, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye. For I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. For he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye shall see him. Oh, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. There's no doubt that the followers of Jesus had peculiar feelings during this time, feelings of fear. They were hiding. There was bewilderment because of all that Jesus said. It didn't seem to fit. He said he was establishing a kingdom. He said he came to make everything right. And now everything seems so wrong. He's dead and in a tomb. 
I'm sure there was disappointment as maybe they glanced at one another, Peter and John and Matthew and Bartholomew, and they glanced at one another with nothing to say, with heads hung low and eyes that couldn't keep eye contact because there was such severe disappointment. And at the same time, Jesus' enemies are rejoicing. The scribes and the Pharisees who hated Jesus from the beginning they are rejoicing with glee and excitement because now they have accomplished it. He is dead. They saw his dead body come down from the cross. But even still, these scribes and Pharisees are a little bit unsettled. That's why they said, would you mind, Pilate, if we watch that tomb for a while? Even still unsettled. I like this passage of Scripture. One of the reasons because is because we see the intimate knowledge of God into the heart of man. There are two women here in chapter 28 that the Bible says they came to the tomb. The Bible says that they came at the end of the Sabbath as it began to dawn toward the first day of the, of the week. And at that very moment, a visitor came. The very moment that these two women approached the tomb, a visitor comes. Do you know that God is always on time? These two women, by the way, Mary Magdalene, you may not know much about her, but you can read in Luke 8 that she was possessed of seven devils and Jesus cast them out of her. Wow. And then the other Mary, you say, who's the other Mary in verse 1? It says Mary Magdalene, and who is the other Mary? Well, I believe the other Mary is listed for us in chapter 27, just back a few verses in verse 56. The Bible says, among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. You know who Zebedee's children were? James and John. And here is the mother of James and John, along with Mary Magdalene, and they go to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. It was not embalming the body. There was, Jesus had shed his blood. They were going to anoint the body with spices, we're told in Mark chapter number 16, sweet spices, uh, uh, wonderful smelling spices. And do you know why they were taking sweet smelling spices to a tomb? Because death stinks. Death stinks. When Lazarus was in the tomb and Jesus said, I'm going to raise him out, they said, well, he's been dead for three days, and by now he stinketh. The decay of death. I don't think the human brain can ever forget the smell of death. It's a unique smell. And death does stink. And these women, with all of good intentions, wanted to somehow sweeten the smell, cover up the smell of the stinking death. But I am glad that they didn't have to cover up the smell of a decaying body of our Savior. the very right time the angel appears at the very right time the bible says there's an earthquake in verse number two and this angel descends from heaven and rolled back the stone from the door god knows timing really well and i want to remind us that in our life god knows timing really well he knows the times of my life he knew the time of my birth he knows the time of my death he knows the times whenever I need him or whenever there's certain areas in my life that are troubling. He knows those times. Also, something else in this passage that was interesting to me is the women approach the tomb, but the problem is there's a stone in front of the door. And we don't have time to turn there today, but in Mark's account, he said that the women uh, talked one with another and said, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher because it's very great. Sounds like a good problem, doesn't it? What are we going to do with this seeming problem? And beyond that, these uh, scribes and Pharisees are really intent on nobody getting close to this tomb in so much that there is a guard. Can I say this? God also knows how to take care of troubles. Did the women have to roll the stone away? Nope. Did they have to deal with any guards? Nope. <laughs> When they approached and that angel came down at just the right time and sat upon that, the Bible says the angel rolled the stone away. And for fear, those keepers did quake and became as dead men. I thank God that he's able to cure a troubled heart. 
I thank God that no stone is too big for him to roll away. That no person in your life is too strong for him to bring to their knees. That no problem is too big for him to solve or no door is too, too, too hard for him to open. Or no sickness is too hard for him to cure. Or new, no heart is too hard for him to save. God can take care of our troubles. Then the Bible also tells us here about the knowledge of God. In verse number 4. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, this is 28 and verse number 5, the angel said, Fear not ye, for I know. Fear not ye, for I know. How did the angel know? The angel knew because God told the angel so. There's something wonderful about God. You know what it is? It's called his omniscience. Which means there's nothing that God does not know. We live a life of discovery. From, the, from birth, we live the life of discovery. We learn things. I was helping my sons tie their ties this morning, and all of us men can relate. Tying a tie from the other side is hard. <laughs> like, I can do it this way, but I can't do it that way. And helping them tie this tie and the, the, the discovery of, oh, I see it goes around and then it goes to the back. And, and then in my family, here's the problem. Every time we tie a tie, it looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> so another challenge that we have to deal with. Life is a life of discovery. But I want you to remember this. God discovers, has a, he doesn't have anything to discover. He knows. He knows everything. He knew that they were afraid. When you're afraid, God knows. When you're worried, God knows. When you feel alone, God knows. And then the angel said, I know what you're here for. You've come to see the body of, seek, you have seek Jesus, which was crucified. He knew what they had come to do. He knew the intent of their heart. Now that's a scary thing. Because we can hide intent. We can do things and say things and mask why we're saying it or doing it. Right? We can cover up the motive. And we're really good at it as people. We're really good at covering the, up the motive. And the angel said this, I know why you're here. I know what your heart's wanted. I know what's inside of you. Because God had disclosed that to the angel. The Bible says that God knows the intents of the heart. In fact, when he would interact with people through his ministry, he would answer the question before they asked the question. And the answer that they would give was the answer he knew they would give. The Bible tells us that no one had to tell Jesus what was in man because he knows what's in man. Can I say this today? God knows what brought you here. He knows what brought you here. He knows what's in your heart. He's able to discern and cut apart the intents of the heart. I thank God for his intimate knowledge of me. Thank the Lord that he has such great knowledge of who I am and my troubles and my heart and my intent and my fears and the timing of my life. He knows it all. It's a wonderful truth of God's intimate knowledge. But I particularly like verse number 6 where the angel said this, He is not here for he has risen as he said. And church, would you tell me what the next word is? Come. 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 God is the God of invitations. Amen, church? Amen. Come. Come. These were women, one of which was possessed of demons not long prior. Another one was the mother of a couple of particular disciples who she said to Jesus, I want one of my boys to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Some of you remember this? This is the mother of James and John who had a little prideful streak in her. It was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary who the angel said, come on in. Come on in and see. <clears throat> what a wonderful thing that we have a God that invites us. 
They came expecting for Jesus to still be dead. And when the angel rolled the stone away, it was not to let Jesus out. He was already out. He's already out. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was unusual because his resurrected body was just a little bit different. You say, what's the big deal about that? Someday we'll have a resurrected body, which is different. Praise the Lord. I don't know the molecular structure, whatever it was, but, but, but stone and mortar and walls didn't pertain to the resurrection body of Jesus. They were in the upper room and no one was there. Then all of a sudden, he's there. Not opening a door, not opening a window, he's just there. When he was walking with them on the road to Emmaus and they were, their hearts were burning, he was talking to them about the Old Testament, you remember? And all of a sudden they look over and he's gone. The stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out. The stone was rolled away so that you and I can look in. He is not here. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And ever since that day, ever since this day, Matthew 28, the invitation of God has been, come and see. Come. Come and see. Whosoever will may come. In Noah's day, anyone who wanted to get in the ark could get in the ark. It was an open invitation. You want spared from the judgment to come? You can come into the ark. And Noah preached it for a hundred years, I believe. Come into the ark and be saved. It was an open invitation. And here's how the Bible ends. And the spirit and the bride say, come. This is Revelation 22. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Amen. I have rejoicing in my heart today that there was a time when I heard the gospel. And the gospel that I heard was simple. Jesus died and is rose again, risen again. Come to him and be saved. And I came. I came. It's a wonderful invitation. It was an invitation that was connected to the words of Jesus Christ because the angel said, He is not here for he is risen as he said. Here's what's interesting. The angel did not expect the women to believe his word. He said, I want you to believe your eyes and Jesus' words. So he is risen as he said. The angel didn't say, I'm telling you he's risen, or it's my testimony that he's risen. He said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. He is risen as he said. Do you know, church, that we have an as he said? You say, what do you want me to come and see? I want you to come and see that everything Jesus said is true. That's the invitation. The invitation is go ahead and prove him. Prove this his word, prove his book, prove his truth, prove his gospel. Jesus had told the disciples that they were going to Jerusalem for his crucifixion. And on the third day he shall rise again. That's in Matthew chapter number 20. Jesus told his disciples in chapter 26, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. He had told them so. He also told them in Mark chapter number 10 that I will be scourged and spit upon and they shall kill me. And the third day I will rise again in Mark chapter number 14. In Mark chapter number 14 also he said, after I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. Jesus had told them and told them and told them and told them and told them. And now the angel says, what he told you is true. Now I want you to know, church family, I'd get out of the ministry if I couldn't tell you that what God has said is true. Every word that Jesus said is true. The gospel is true. Salvation is true. Heaven is true. Hell is true. Redemption is true. Forgiveness is real. Sin is real. Satan is real. The Garden of, of Eden is real. The New Jerusalem is real. Streets of gold are real. Angels are real. Demons are real. If it were not so, Jesus said, I would have told you. 
I pray that as Christians we would have a resurgence in the faith of what God said is true. Well, I believe these women were persuaded of it when the angel said, He is not here, for he has risen as he said. And one more thing that encouraged me from this story is that of a changed life. Verse number 7, the angel told these women, And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear. That's understandable. But how about this? And great joy. And did run to bring his disciples word. When I met Jesus, I left with great joy too. How about you, church family? When I met the risen Savior... When I realized he died for me, when I confessed him as my Lord and repented of my sins, and I got under the blood, I left that place with great joy. I left there with great joy because I finally found someone who loved me with an amazing love. Now, I've had many people love me through my life, but no one ever cared for me like Jesus. No one's ever loved me like him. I left the... the, the Meeting Jesus Christ, not only with the joy of amazing love, but the joy of complete forgiveness. Those of you that are saved and born again know what I'm talking about. Isn't that clean feeling wonderful? When you trust Christ and you believe in the Lord and his blood has washed you from your sin and you know that you're different, you know that the old is past and the new is before, and you know that you're a new creature, you're not theologically an expert, but you just feel clean. I love the joy of the cleanness of the forgiveness of sins. And how about the joy of good news to give? These women who left that empty tomb that day were told by the angel, go tell his disciples that he has risen as he said. And although it's not completely recorded for us how they relayed that message, I can sort of envision it. Let me explain it. Do you think these women came to the disciples and said, well, you know, oh, no. we got up really early this morning. I'm a little tired. Went over to our tomb and, you know, weird stuff's happening today, let me tell you. And something happened. We just got to let you guys know that there's an angel there shining real bright, hurting my eyes, you know, brightness and stuff. And, and uh, we're probably going to get accused of hurting those guards over there, you know, and, and they're all on the ground. And it's just been one of those. I guarantee you they didn't portray it that way. And I, I just felt so convicted when I was reading this. I thought, why don't I share the gospel with a little more joy? Why is it when I hand someone a track, I feel like I'm ruining their day? Why is it that when I attempt to talk to somebody about the Lord. I feel like I'm imposing. God help us for a feeling that way. It's the greatest news mankind can ever hear Amen. is that there's a risen Savior who saves Amen. and washes us clean. These ladies, these women left because they had good news to share and the gospel is that it is good news. It is news that you can be forgiven and have heaven as your home and walk through life with a wonderful Savior and be a new creature and have old things passed away, all things become new. It's the greatest news you'll ever hear. May God give us that joy of good news again. And also, how about the joy of an anticipated meeting? All they saw at the tomb was an angel. And granted, it'd be pretty cool to see an angel, wouldn't you think? Pretty amazing thing. The earthquake and the brightness of his raiment like snow, his countenance was shining. The power that these guys just fell over when he arrived. I think that would be pretty powerful. But going to the tomb and just seeing an angel still leaves something missing. And the angel said, go ahead, tell his disciples. Because, in verse 7, he goeth before you into Galilee. You all got to read it with me, and I'm going to bring this to a close. Verse 7. Tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. And what does it say there, church? There shall ye see him. 
I guarantee that put a spring in their step. Seeing an angel is wonderful. But you mean we're going to go to Galilee and we will see him there? The Bible says in verse 8, And they departed and quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. Now verse number 9, And as they went to tell his disciples, Behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, and go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Here's one big thing about a resurrection that you got to grab before we leave this place. The resurrection brings me great joy because I know that I shall see him myself someday. In Acts chapter number 1, when Jesus ascended back into heaven and those dejected disciples were there with sullen faces, an angel gave another message, and here it is. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? Please listen as I close. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as she have seen him go into heaven. Dear brother and sister in Christ, I wasn't there on that day when they hung him on the cross. And I wasn't there that day when the angel rolled the stone away. I read it through the wonder and the amazement of the Word of God. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we saw him today? Just take a deep breath. Wouldn't it be wonderful if today was the promised day where Jesus said, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give to those, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know the scriptures. Wouldn't it be wonderful if today was the day that we saw our Savior, the risen Savior, the living Savior, the joy of a changed life. Your life cannot be the same once you meet the risen Savior. Cannot be the same. As a preacher, one of the things that I must do in the ministry is funerals. And here we have two women arriving at a cemetery, if you'll allow me to say a cemetery, not as our cemeteries are. This was a tomb that was in a garden. But here we have two women visiting a cemetery, and this is sort of familiar for us. Because which of us hasn't visited a cemetery? I'm sure very few of us could say, I've never been. Most of us have. We've walked down those rows with those markers on left and right. We've read the names and the year of the birth and the year of the death and the, the name of the wife and the husband's name and sometimes children's names. And we've walked through that cemetery where so for some of us the bodies of our loved ones are buried there. <coughs> and as a preacher, I know I've done it maybe a hundred times, probably more where we all get in our cars and we make our way to the cemetery. <clears throat> and the hearse parks at a place close by the grave site. And it doesn't matter whether it's rain, sun, snow, sleet, uh, or summertime or spring or winter. We bundle up if we need to or use an umbrella if we need to and casket is rolled out of that hearse and those family members that are close and those that have been chosen carry it up to the place where it will be put to its final rest. And when that casket is placed there on those straps and the close family sits in the front few chairs and others just gather around me, here's what always happens. Is the funeral director, whenever he feels he or she feels like everything's ready, he or she looks over at me as if to say, Go ahead. And I look there. I usually try to look at that front row of family, sometimes a husband or a wife or children. 
And I see the sorrow on their faces. And I'm admitting to you that often in my heart, there's a conflict. What am I going to say? How am I going to fix this? You can't fix this. They can't bring their loved one back. But here's what I've begun to do, and maybe I'll continue to do it the same way. I don't know. I tell that family, I said, you know, here we are at a grave. And we're going to put our loved one in the grave because we've done all we can do. All that human hands can do have been done. And I tell those that are gathered there at the graveside, I said, I want to invite you to take a trip in your mind to another grave. It's going to take you a lot longer to get there than it did for us to drive to this place. It would take you a couple of long airplane flights to get there. But I want to take you to another grave. It's a grave that's in a garden. It's a grave that's hewn out of a rock. It's a grave that was owned by a rich man named Joseph and used by a man named Jesus who just borrowed it. And I tell that family that's seated there, I said, if it weren't for that empty tomb halfway around the world, we'd have no hope at this grave today. But because our Savior lives, but because we have a risen Savior, but because we have a Savior who conquered death, hell, and the grave, if it weren't for that, we'd be of all men most miserable. But I tell that family, thank God for an empty tomb halfway around the world. And I want to say today, thank God for an empty tomb halfway around the world. I've been to that place that we believe is the place. I've been there twice. You'll never get over the feeling. Some of you that have been there, you'll never get over the feeling of waiting in line to walk in. It's always a line. You've got to wait your turn. You get a, a minute or two inside. It's real close to where Jesus was crucified, right outside of Jerusalem. It's a garden tomb. It's a garden there, hewn out of a rock. You walk inside that door. And you look to your right, and you see a carved out, rock area, sort of just like a platform, like a, like a table. And you see the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life. Nothing. Nothing. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Praise him for being our risen Savior. Amen, church? Can we bow our heads quietly for prayer today with our heads bowed and eyes closed? Yes, he knows you today. He knows you very